Hello, and thank you for joining us for this Calford Seedon Sustainability Seminar. This is a recording of a live event that was held in the summer of 2020, and it covers the principles of Passive House and the Partel regulations. The team members giving this presentation are Dr Terry Keach, our Head of m and &E Services, Petrula Christopoulou, who is a mechanical engineer and passive house designer, and Emily Mansfield, who is a sustainability consultant and passive house consultant. A brief introduction to our services. Calford Seedon is a multidisciplinary construction and property consultancy with a trading history of nearly 80 years. All services are provided in-house by directly employed teams, and we operate from six offices across the UK. We hope you enjoy watching. Please get in touch using the details at the end of the recording if you have any questions or would like to register interest in future events. Uh, so generally the content for today is we're going to look at the building regulations and the changes to part of the building regulations and its, and its impacts. Uh, we're going to look at the SAP methodology because that's used as the uh, verification method for building regulations. And we're then going to move on to Passive House. And the, and the reason we're going to move on to Passive House and to Passive House principles is what we've noticed from these new building regulations is the drive for reducing CO2 is having a major drive towards looking at electricity as one of the options to reduce CO2 emissions. Now, whilst that's good and whilst everyone will applaud that, electricity is still an expensive energy medium. And um, one of the things that we're particularly worried about at Calford Seedon is that that, that energy medium um, could have uh, detrimental effects to residents, uh, energy bills, energy prices. So what we've tried to do is, is to blend in this presentation of the building regulations is to really look at the passive elements of the building. So even when we're not going down a passive house approach to look at the passive elements, because everything we can do in the building will reduce that energy and therefore reduce the the implications of the possible higher costs of electricity uh, we're going to go on to have a little look at the estimated construct construction costs and uh, and what that looks like and some of the elements that build up those construction costs so it, it gives you an idea of what those are and then we're going to do a few slides at the end for achieving zero carbon and then we'll have a q a session so without further ado, I'll, I'll land over to Emily. Emily. Thank you very much, Terry. Good afternoon, all. Um, so the first part, we're going to look at the Partel consultation, which was released in October last year, along with the updated SAP methodology. Um, so SAP version 10.1 was released with the uh, consultation. Um, currently, we are working to SAP 2012 methodology, which checks compliance against Part L1A 2013 of the building regulations. So what are the cha general changes? The background calculation has been updated. Um, for example, the heating pattern has been updated to reflect how people actually use their, their heating. Um, so currently it's assumed that there's a different heating pattern at the weekend where, where research has been undertaken. It's uh, been seen that people actually use their heating the same throughout the week for a similar period. So that's, that's just to um, make sure that the energy consumption is calculated more accurately under the new regulations. Hot water um, calculation also includes the flow rates for showers and baths and the use of electric showers. So again, this is just so the energy calculation for hot water is calculated more accurately. Um, flow rates for showers, uh, the SAP software allows a minimum flow rate of 8 litres per minute. So if you go below that, um, currently there won't be any benefit uh, to the SAP calculation, but obviously you might need to go lower to achieve your Part G compliance. Um, same with electric showers, the minimum output is 9 kilowatts. Um, so if you find an electric shower with a lower output, you won't see the benefit in the SAP calculation, but it will be the benefit in reality. Um, lighting calculation has been updated to allow the input of each individual light fitting um, so you can put the efficiency of each light fitting that you have in the dwelling. At the moment we just say 100% low energy lighting so again this is just so the energy consumption can be calculated more accurately. Summer overheating has been uh, criteria has been updated that you now need to consider air quality and noise pollution issues. So if you're near an airport, main roads and um, train station, you have to take that into account and um, the occupants won't be opening the windows during the night. 
Whereas currently, if you have a flat on an upper floor and there's no security risks, you can say your uh, occupants will have their windows fully open all the time. So your path criterion free in the current Partel really easy. Whereas in the new Partel, it's likely that you'll see some more failures um, where you'll have air quality and noise pollution issues. Default efficiencies and ventilation rates have been updated to reflect the current market. And the thermal mass parameter has to be calculated. So at the moment, we can use a simple um, thermal mass parameter for timber frames, uh, low for timber frames, medium for light concrete frames, and dense for, uh, uh, sorry, high for dense concrete frames. Uh, that's more work for the SAP calculator rather than uh, the client or design team. So the key changes, um, these have the biggest impact to the calculation and the results. So thermal bridging, uh, the Y value, the default has been increased from 0.15 watts per meter squared Kelvin to 0 0.2 and this has quite a big impact as you are probably aware under current regulations it's already difficult to use the default Y value of 0 0.15 and we tend to use um, calculated Psi values or accredited construction details. Now the government is saying that they're going to scrap accredited construction details but they are likely to bring in a new library where you can look for details that are similar to your development and then apply them to your scheme. Alternatively, if you have details that aren't really relevant to the ones available in the library, you'll have to have the uh, side values calculated. So that's where your external wall meets your ground floor or your roof, wherever there's a break in the installation, and you could have a cold bridge. And once you've carried out a calculation based on the detail, you can then use that across your development. And if you have the same detail on other developments, you can carry it across to that as well. So as long as you keep the details the same or similar, you can carry those calculations across and you won't have to keep paying um, to get the bespoke calculations recalculated. Solar photovoltaic or PV array now recognises the use of battery storage and diverter. So the diverter uses electricity generated from your PV to your uh, hot water cylinder to heat your hot water cylinder so you're not using electricity for the immersion. Currently, the SAP methodology assumes that 50% of electricity generated from PV is used in the dwelling and 50% is exported. Since the closure of the feed-in tariff, this is encouraging us to use more of the electricity generated within our dwellings rather than exporting back to the grid which is now this beneficial, beneficial if you don't get as much of a payback. QT heating distribution pipe work losses factor has been increased from 1.05 to 2, and that has quite a huge impact on the results. And again, this is encouraging us to insulate um, to make sure that we reduce any heat losses. If you use the SIPSI code of practice, then you can reduce that uh, default from 2 to 1.5. Fuel tariffs and CO2 emissions and primary energy factors have also been, been updated, which we'll look at in the following slides. We have included primary energy factors because under the new part of our consultation, it has been shown that primary energy um, will be one of the main performance uh, metrics under Criterion 1. So instead of running the fabric energy efficiency that we see at the moment, that will be replaced by um, primary energy as well as the CO2 emissions. And primary energy is basically all the fuel used to create your um, fuel that you use in your dwelling. And um, that's for electricity, it's all your gas, your coal, your wind turbines, your PV, all that energy to create your electricity and to deliver it to your dwelling. So here are the updated fuel tariffs for mains gas and electricity. SAP 2012, which is the current, and SAP 10.1, which was released in October last year of the Partel consultation. We can see that the fuel tariff for mains gas has increased ever so slightly um, by 13%. However, for electricity, we can see quite a significant increase of 33%. And we can see that it's also a lot higher than mains gas. Um, so if we are being pushed down the electric heating route, we have to be aware that this could be very expensive to the end user. And the energy performance certificate is based on the energy efficiency of your house. So that's the running cost for your heating, hot water and lighting. So if you went down direct electric heating, um, again, you have to be aware that this could lead to a poor performance EPC rating. It's also worth noting electricity export tariff, which is shown to have been reduced quite significantly. And again, this is taking into account the closure of the feed-in tariff. So it's gone from 13.19 pence per kilowatt hour to just 5.3 pence. 
electric uh, suppliers, electricity suppliers can set their own rate, um, which is why the SAP has chosen uh, the 5.3 pence per kilowatt hour. So here are the updated CO2 emissions. Again, we're looking at mains gas and electricity. And we've got SAP 2012, we've got the GLA CO2 emissions, as they are basing their CO2 emissions for new planning applications on SAP 10 methodology, which was released in July 2018. And then we have the SAP 10.1. So we can see that for mains gas, there's been a slight reduction of only 3% um, compared to current SAP methodology. However, for electricity, the GLA are using a CO2 emission factor of 0.233, which is a 55% reduction over current regulations, and still higher than mains gas. But the SAP 10.1 methodology that was released in October last year shows a CO2 emission factor of 0.136, and that's a 74% reduction over current regulations. And it's also shown to be lower than mains gas. So here it's, it's showing us that we're encouraging the use of electricity um, instead of mains gas due to the decarbonisation of the national electricity grid. One thing to note is that electric generating technologies such as your CHP or combined heat and power or your PV array, you'll require more in order to have the same CO2 emission saving as current regulations. If you can see my mouse. So here we can see the CO2 emissions uh, for 10, SAT 10.1. You'll need to take that bar and keep putting it on top until you reach the same CO2 emission savings as current regulations. So you'll need more PV in order to achieve that 0 0.519. Updated primary energy uh, factors, again for mains gas and electricity. We can see that mains gas has reduced only slightly by 7%. And again, electricity has reduced quite significantly, taking into account um, the decarbonisation of the grids and the use of renewable technologies. However, it is worth noting that electricity is still higher than mains gas under primary energy. So if primary energy is going to be a mains uh, performance metric and you're using direct electric heating, it might be that you'll fail the primary energy target um, rather than compared to mains gas. So it's just Emily, worth it. Emily, could I come in now? Of course. Uh, one one point that we've been looking at as well with this, and we feel that this is a definite drive away from just using direct electricity and making it a requirement for that electricity use to be part and parcel of a renewable source. So instead of us just going back to the days of, of putting in direct electric heating into flats, I think this idea of keeping with the primary energy calculation still being above gas is is to deter that and to make us move toward a, towards a renewable source uh, for that electrical energy thanks emily that's okay no worries so here are some of the key changes um within the new partel consultation so criterion one as we just saw and discussed it's going to focus on primary energy as well as co2 emissions Householder affordability, so there's going to be a new regulation requirement um, to ensure that the house will be or dwelling will be affordable to the end user and um, with regards to heating, hot water and lighting. So this could potentially be based on the EPC rating and they might set a minimum EPC rating to achieve. So again, if you go direct electric heating and um, such as panel heaters, this may not be affordable unless you make improvements elsewhere, such as reducing, um, improving the building fabric to reduce the space heating demand the implementation of renewable technologies and um, battery storage or the use of diverters on site. Some overheating, um, so the government have been asked to uh, put in a new regulation that ensures that properties that could be prone to overheating um, are not built. So it might be that they require developments to have uh, the SIPSI TM59 dynamic simulation and uh, assess your property against that criteria. At the moment, you see that in London anyway, but outside of London, it's not so common, but it might be uh, become more commonplace even outside of London. Air pressure testing. So the Part F consultation in indicates that all dwellings um, may need to be tested. At the moment, that's common practice most of the time, um, but you do have a choice of testing only a sample of dwellings and a penalty of two being added to the average test result um, for the dwellings not tested. 
Electricity, CO2 emission factors and primary energy and costs, we've just looked at on the previous slides. Um, the two options uh, for the notional reading, which is the target emission rate specification and your target primary energy rate specification. And so they've currently got two options. Option one, that's improving the building fabric, um, such as triple glazing. And that has a 20% CO2 emission reduction over the current part L. Whereas option two, has similar building fabric to the current notional building, um, but uses renewable technologies such as PV um, to achieve a 31% CO2 emission reduction over the current um, part L. Option two is currently the government's preferred option, even though it has the highest estimated build cost compared to option one, um, but it also has the highest in, uh, running cost uh, savings for the householder which is probably why it's the government's uh, preferred option. I'll now pass you over to Petula, who will go through the Passive House Principles. Um, thank you, Emily. Uh, now we will continue uh, in the next topic, which is the Passive House Principles. Uh, According to Passipedia, which is the Wikipedia for Passive House, a passive house is a building in which thermal comfort can be achieved, can be provided solely by heating or cooling of the fresh air flow, which is required for good indoor air quality. In practice, this is a building where the space heating demand um, requirement is designed close to the theoretical minimum by applying uh, the fabric first approach to its full extent in terms of insulation and air tightness. So it's insulation before heating. All installed services will also be designed as low energy. While the definition refers to thermal comfort being provided by heating of the fresh air flow, this doesn't mean that it has to be from air heating. The, uh, the heating demand can be provided from radiators or underfloor heating. This slide uh, shows them uh, the minimum criteria in order to achieve passive house for certification. And the first criteria is the air tightness. The air tightness that should be achieved is 0 0.6 air changes per hour at 50 Pascal, which is approximately one cubic meter per hour meter squared, uh, depending on the volume of the building. Air tests are required to be carried out similar with sub calculations. However, in passive house, it is required that the property is tested under both pressurized and depressurized conditions and to ensure that the design standards are achieved. The dwellings should be also tested throughout the construction in order to ensure that leaks are detected early and rectified. It is suggested to air pressure test the, uh, the property throughout the construction uh, in order to make sure that we're going to achieve the criteria uh, when the construction is completed. So we would recommend to air pressure test the, the property when the air tightness is installed and then air pressure test it again when the uh, services or the part partitions are installed in order to ensure that the air tightness layer has not been damaged. The second criteria is the surface temperature, which should not be less than 17 degrees Celsius in order to reduce uh, cold radiant and risk of mold. And this is why thermal bridge thermal and sorry, thermal bridge free junctions and trim glaze in, are required in a passive house. It should be highlighted that the design internal temperature at, for a passive house is 20 degrees Celsius, and it's important to keep internal uh, temperatures at a comfortable level uh, throughout the year. Therefore, we have the summer overheating criteria, which states that the internal temperature must not exceed 25 degrees Celsius for more than 10% throughout the year. It is suggested, though, that it's not exceeded for more than 5% during the design stage in order that uh, uh, the design is not scrutinized during a certification. Because of the air tightness level of a passive house building, we should make sure that, that we have adequate fresh air entering the property in order to keep the occupants healthy and comfortable. Uh, therefore, we have the ventilation criteria, which states that uh, the ventilation rate should be 30 cubic meters per hour per person. And under, as mentioned earlier, um, the um, heating demand is, should be designed close to the theoretical minimum. Uh, and therefore, uh, the implementation of MVHR is um, important uh, in a passive house, 
as the MVHR recovers the heat lost through extra extraction from the wet rooms and transfers back to the incoming air, uh, preheating the air entering the apartment and reducing the space heating demand. The annual heating demand that should be less or equal to 135 kilowatt hours per meter square per year, or uh, the peak heating load should not be less than 10 watts per meter square. Heating demand is reduced through improving the build quality by employing the fabric first approach. And the primary edge energy should not should be equal to 135 kilowatt hours per meter square, and that's that's the UK figure. That figure uh, is different based on the location of the property. Uh, it is also important to note that if a renewable uh, are um, added to the development, a reduced primary energy target, the renewable primary energy, uh, is, is set. That is to ensure that renewable technologies are not be used as bolt-on in order to achieve the CO2 emissions target and the energy target. Uh, the, the figures uh, shown on the um, slide are, again, the UK figures. And uh, the, primary the renewable primary energy target depends on the location of the property. Uh, we will continue with the key elements uh, for designing a passive house. The first is the shape and the orientation. Uh, on the slide, we have a diagram that shows the form heat loss factor. Uh, and as we can see, uh, when the shapes are simple and compact, the form heat loss factor is low. That means that the building will not uh, require ex uh, extensive insulation in order to achieve the heating demand targets. Uh, further up the chart, where we have uh, more complex shapes, the form heat loss factor is higher. That doesn't mean that we cannot have a complex shape building uh, for a passive house. It does mean that we need careful detailing for thermal bridging and more insulation to, to achieve the annual heating demand target. And in principle, the lower the form heat loss factor, uh, the better. Thermal bridging should be reduced uh, as practically as possible uh, in a passive house, as passive houses as, as con are considered thermal bridge-free, and it is important to achieve thermal bridge-free junctions. The orientation of the building is also important in order to optimize the solar gains from the east to west elevations, where habitable rooms should be located. Smaller areas of glazing can be located on the north elevation as they uh, achieve no, no solar gains, uh, so they are not beneficial to the energy balance and can cause uh, heat losses. Shading should be provided to reduce um, the risk of summer overheating. Actual external shading can be considered the key in order to avoid uh, overheating during summer months as it stops the solar gains from entering the property. Passive house requires a good level of continuous insulation, as we can see on the section on this slide. Uh, we would recommend to start uh, with a 500 millimeters external wall during the early stage of the design, and that can be reduced uh, as the design progresses. Triple glazed windows, as we can see on the section, uh, are required in order to achieve uh, surface uh, temperature requirements. Windows are to be set back into the insulation layer to reduce thermal bridging. Uh, that also provides a good reveal during summer months uh, uh, in order to uh, avoid overheating. And the MVHR should be located close to the external wall as we can, as uh, we have to keep the intake and the exhaust as short as practically possible. The intake and the exhaust ducts should be insulated, and the minimum insulation thickness uh, should be 50 millimeters uh, of continuous insulation without gaps. Overhangs and balconies should be externally supported when it's possible. If the um, if uh, the supports uh, if uh, um, penetrate the insulation layer, uh, then uh, a detailing should be carried out during early design in order to help reduce the cold bridging. In the diagram to the right-hand side of the slide here, we can see a typical uh, section through an external element of a passive house. Weather barrier should be on the external side, 
the insulation and the structure can be swapped in order to suit the design. And the internal side, we should have the air barrier. Again, the, the structure and the air barrier can be swapped, but we should make sure that always the air barrier is on the internal side of the insulation. And now Emily will uh, continue with costs and achieving zero carbon. Thank you. Thank you, Petrula. Um, so here we can see the proposed um, specification for the Notional Building 1 and Notional, uh, Notional Building 2 under the new Partel consultation. So uh, figures in blue show where they're different to the current Notional Building specification under SEPT 2012 and Part L 2013. So here we can see that the external wall UV has been reduced to 0 0.15 from 0 0.18 and the walls and roofs have been reduced from 0 0.13 to 0 0.11. Biggest impact is the uh, windows. We've got triple glazing uh, with a U value of 0 0.8 and a glazing G value uh, solar transmittance of 0 0.57. So the current one assumes 0 0.63. They have also used enhanced side values um, compared to ACDs, so this means that the thermal bridging details are more uh, well insulated to reduce heat loss um, through your junctions, your cold bridging junctions. So these are almost in line with the passive house criteria um, for a building with a form heat loss factor on the lower end of the scale, um, so where less insulation is required. Uh, under Notional Building 2, we can see that most of the U values are very similar to the current Notional building, uh, apart from the roofs, where that's been reduced to 0 0.11. The glazing has also been slightly reduced from 1.4 to 1.2, so that's uh, high end double glazing or possibly even triple glazing. Um, but the solar transmittance or glazing G value is still at 0 0.63. Uh, the thermal bridging is very similar to uh, the current Notional Building with some slightly enhanced site values, but nowhere near as enhanced as what's in under the Notional Building uh, 1. And the air permeability is 5. So if we take a passive house, and this is for a passive house um, where you're in the middle of that form heat loss uh, factor scale that Petruda showed earlier on the highest end. We've got U value there of 0 0.12 for the walls and 0 0.09 for the floors and roofs. The glazing, triple glazing, and this is the, uh, the worst U value you can use for a passive house of 0 0.85. So that's, that's even worse than what's being used in the notional building for number one. And the glazing G value of 0 0.5. We can also see that another big impact area in passive house is the thermal bridging, where we have thermal bridge junctions. So we've applied a side value of 0 0.05 in the SEP calculations. And the design air permitty rate, so to achieve that 0 0.6 air changes at 50 pascals, we've got an air permitty rate of 1. It's very airtight. And because of that air tightness, as Petruda pointed out, we require mechanical ventilation with heat recovery. And if we uh, was going for passive house certification, then we'd use the certified unit to stop us getting that 12% penalty on our efficiency. So what's the estimated um, uplift costs for passive house development? The Passive House Trust uh, carried out a study and released a document in October 2019 on passive house construction costs. Uh, that is available online and we encourage you to have a look. Um, so uh, by applying best practice, uh, extra costs uh, were indicated to have an uplift of around 8 to 11 percent. Exeter, who have had nine years experience in building the passive house, already show about an 8 percent uplift in costs. However, it is predicted or estimated that if passive house was uh, become a standard nationwide, so it was used at high scale, then those estimated costs would be reduced to only 4 percent over a typical um, standards like the common standards that we see now. Areas that are shown to have the greatest additional costs are wall and roof structures and that's due to the um, better detailing for the uh, thermal bridging and also the um, thicker layer of insulation required. The use of mechanical ventilation and heat recovery. So if we went for certified units we can see that the cost uplifting cost is quite high compared to non-passive house certified units and that is just due to um, Competition, there's lack of competition at the moment on the market. So again, if it was Passive House was adopted um, nationwide or became a standard, then it's likely there'll be more competition, which will reduce uh, the costs and get us more around to that 4% uplift cost. Also, air tightness testing. So it's more rigorous standard, as uh, Petruda demonstrated, and also you have to carry out multiple tests uh, throughout the construction. 
And site supervision can also be up to £80 per metre squared, um, but if you apply best practice um, through uh, better design and simple construction standards and quality assurance, then that site supervision cost can be reduced, significantly reduced. Emily, could I, could I just come in there? Um, experience that we've had, though, um, uh, across a number of schemes is, is this element of site supervision is really, really important. We've, we've found that where uh, Passive House trained uh, site supervisors or advice to those su site supervisors is given, uh, earlier stage interventions can be put into place so that you're not working further down the line the scheme when there then becomes problems that are quite difficult to, to get back and rectify. So we would say of all of these things, a major element to look at is that site supervision and the way that's managed. Absolutely critical, I think, in Passive House. Thanks, Emily. Exactly, no worries. So now we're gonna have a look at um, how you can achieve zero carbon. So let's not forget the energy hierarchy. Uh, this has been taken from the London plan, um, which I'm sure you're uh, very uh, used to by now. Um, so you've got B lean, which is use less energy. So that's for your fabric uh, efficiency. So by applying passive house measures, you can really um, reduce your energy demand and your CO2 emissions through the B lean stage. B clean, um, so that's applying energy efficiently. So connecting to a um, district heating network or also creating one um, or the use of combined heat and power and be green which is your use of renewable technologies. So London plan requires you to achieve a 35% reduction in CO2 over current building regulations and anything to zero carbon is then paid off into an offset fund. The current carbon offset payment is £60 per tonne of CO2 over 30 years, so £1,800 per tonne of CO2. However, the draft London plan proposes £95 per tonne of CO2 over 35 years, which is £2,850 per tonne. So that's quite a big increase, and it's also encouraging us to make sure we make more improvements on site so we don't um, just pay off into the carbon offset fund. So here's an example house where we've uh, improved the building fabric over building regulations and applied similar U values required uh, for passive house standards. So for the external wall, we've got 0 0.14, for the floors 0 0.1, and for the roof 0 0.09. We also have triple glazing at 0 0.8 and an air penalty rate of 3, so not quite to the passive house certification standards. And the film bridging has also been calculated to bespoke side values, which are slightly better than the credit construction details. So based on the um, SAP 2012, the current methodology, we're getting a 42% CO2 emission reduction with the use of air source heat pumps. Without any PV, we'd have to pay £4,090 into the carbon offset fund. And that's based on the higher rate of £95 per tonne. Under SAP 10, we're getting a 61% reduction, and that is purely because of the CO2 emission factor for electricity, um, which is a lot lower. So therefore, we get more benefit from using the air source heat pump. And that also reduces the carbon offset fund payment to 1,836. So then we applied PV um, in order to achieve zero carbon. And for this uh, particular dwelling, we'd require 3.27 kilowatt peaks. That's about 10 number um, PV panels, high efficient PV panels. And we also put battery storage in there, so uh, the energy generated by the PV could be used within the dwelling. And because we're achieving zero carbon, that meant we didn't have to pay anything into the carbon offset fund. Apartments, it's a little bit more difficult to achieve zero carbon due to the limited space that you have for um, PV, for roof-mounted uh, plant. So here we've got an improved building fabric, again in line with the uh, passive house requirements, and we did put in an air penalty rate of one, so very airtight, and the use of mechanical ventilation of heat recovery. We used a hybrid uh, community heating system of air source heat pumps and boilers, so it's assumed the air source heat pumps would provide the majority of the heat throughout the year and the boilers would be used as backup. So CO2 emission savings under SAP 2012 was 40% with 27.5 kilowatt peak of PV across the, across the development, across the site. 
This meant we would have to pay £100,000 into the carbon offset fund. Under SAT 10, again, because of the CO2 emissions for electricity, the air source heat pump become more beneficial and therefore save more CO2. So it's then achieving a 52% reduction over uh, the target emission rate. And this reduced our carbon offset fund by £30,000. So now we're looking at the funding costs for these systems. So here's one where we were just achieving building compliance, which is using the specification under the notional building of the current building regulations. And we can see that for electricity, we have very high running costs under the septim figures. However, we are saving a lot more CO2 compared to current um, SAP methodology. And that's purely, again, because of the better CO2 emission factor for electricity. When we improve the building fabric specification, we can see that the amount of um, the running costs <laughs> has been reduced to quite significant for the electricity by £200, but it's still a lot higher than mains gas. And even the, the use of the air source heat pump is still higher than mains gas. Emily, could I could I just come in now? Yeah, of course. I, I think I think one thing we we just want to point to in in while we're showing you these figures and when we move on to the third one is is if you note know with the mains gas boiler and then the air source heat pump, for instance, you're still nearly double the cost per year for that energy. Um, so while CO2 is is and CO2 reductions are massively improving, I think a message that needs to go out and one that we have definitely recognised, which is this unintended consequence, is that while CO2 emissions go down, energy reductions as a result of using electricity as part of those CO2 reductions is not making the the scheme cheaper to run. So therefore, this link between green buildings being uh, cheaper to, to operate and, and, and lower energy bills must be explained fully. And I think whenever you look at a project and whenever a project is put forward under the new SAP 10 and new SAP 10.1, and as we move forward, a, a really early cost analysis of what each of the technologies actually mean for the outturn costs for billing, I think is a really, really important measure because I, I think sometimes a, a sales team or a development team think that this is going to be a very low energy building, so therefore costs will be low. And, and, and all of our experience and our research at the moment is showing that isn't the case. And two or three schemes that we've had going through GLA at the moment, uh, they are EPC rating. Unless we do something very, very dramatic with the building fabric, the EPC ratings are still only bordering on C, B or C. So where employers' requirements documents uh, require a building to be either an EPC rated A or B, we do really need to concentrate on, on, on how we achieve that because it's the cost element within the EPC, not the CO2 element that's, that, that, that will create the lower EPC rating. So an early concentration on these, I think, is really, really important. Thanks, Emily. Exactly. Thank you, Terry. And exactly that, because here we've improved the building fabric to achieve compliance under the current building regulations. This has no uh, renewable technologies, so the resident will have to pay that much uh, for the space heating and hot water. So now on version three, we did um, look at what would be required to achieve zero carbon, and with the air source heat pump, as we showed on the previous slide, you would require 3.27 kilowatt peak of PV. Now, assuming that PV wasn't used in the dwellings, even though we've improved the building fabric specification even further um, to similar to that of Passive House, you still have quite high running costs under electricity, direct electricity, and that is because of the hot water usage. So even your space heating demand has gone down, you've still got your hot water. So this is where we look at battery storage or diverters to uh, ensure that we use that electricity generated by the PV within the dwelling um, so that we can reduce those running costs and the diverter for the hot water, especially if you have direct electric heating, is beneficial as you're not using direct electricity to heat your hot water through the immersion. And Emily, just, just to finish on that, 
but still look at the air source heat pump and mains gas boilers that people are working on at the moment and and you are still getting on for double the cost so remember when the epc is looking at this and when the sap is looking at this that's the thing that's driving your epc rating so it's just to be mindful and aware of those things thanks emily that's okay, no worries. Um, you also note as well under SAP10, uh, we put on 2.94 kilowatt peak of PV, um, but under SAP10, we're not achieving the zero carbon of the mains gas. And that's because, as we saw on those first few slides with the CO2 emission factors, the um, benefit from the PV is a lot less. So for mains gas systems, you'll see quite a significant increase in the amount of PV required to achieve the same CO2 emission savings as, as under current regulations. Thank you for listening and we'll go through the questions.